We've all had those moments. We've all had those times when we think we've had a good relationship with our clients, right? We've been talking to them. The emails have been going back and forth. We've been setting expectations. We thought we'd been real clear. And then all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, complete disaster area, and the project goes off the rails. Maybe it's those 30, 40 emails back and forth. Or maybe it's that client that you've been talking to for a long time about his themed project of future, the futuristic, but then two months before this year-long planning, he calls you and he says, mm, I'm not thinking so much about the future, but more, let's go retro and let's change this up and you've got two months to figure that out. Any of this perhaps sounds a little bit familiar. Yes, well, I am all about the power of human connection, and I love me some humans, but the thing is with humans, a lot of times if we're dealing with humans, there can be miscommunication, misunderstanding, misfiring, and when those things go wrong, we have a chance to turn it around and figure out how to take that disaster and make it into something amazing. And this is the formula, well, today I'm going to share a formula, tried and true, that will help you in these situations take these disasters and make them something awesome. And by the time I got home, I put on my happy Peace Corps smile, and that's when Hoba pointed out the Yanta. And honestly, I was like, Yanta, what's that word? And then I was like, she said I have a tire around my belly. The reaction, the door slammed the tears, and here we are back at that breakfast table. And now you are all probably asking, Aaron, what does you, being a fat white girl in Panama, have to do with me? <laughs> I knew it, and I'm glad that you asked. Because here in that moment, at that breakfast table the next day, I had a choice to make. Just like we all have choices to make when things seem to be a disaster. We can choose to connect, or we can choose to disengage, to walk away, to blow it off, to brush it off, and say nothing's happening. So how often is it that we're sitting there thinking, well, I got this story, but then there's this story, and what's actually true? And in that moment, I realized neither of those stories really mattered, and I thought, what is this really about? Because until I got to that truth of that story in my head and, and with Hoba, we wouldn't be able to move on. And so in that moment, I deflated the tension of that situation by explaining to her my reaction and what I was feeling. We related to each other by telling each other our stories, our emotions, our frustrations about the tourism group, about everything else. And then because of that three-hour conversation, our relationship elevated. And what was a perfectly fine kind of casual relationship really became something strong. And Hoba became my champion, my advocate, my biggest ally. And so the reason I tell you this, because there was the formula. We need to deflate the air out of these situations to be able to get to the truth. Because until we get to the truth, connection can't happen. We need to relate to each other. You all heard I want to be a backup dancer. So if you think that there's not an interpretive dance of the formula involved, you are completely wrong. So we're deflating the balloon. We're relating to each other through empathy, showing that we care. And then we are elevating the situation by taking ownership, by setting our intention, and by taking action. And this is the formula that we are going to work through today. Because when connection happens, magic happens. And when we think we're in a disaster situation, the more disaster it is, the more potential there is for more connection and more magic. So the first step of our formula is the deflate stage. And most of you had noticed my bossy card on the table that says, do not touch yet. So we are, you're about to be able to touch those cards. And what I'm going to do, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> what we are going to do is we are going to have a story session activity. And in this story session, there's a few rules that you all need to play by. So the first one is we need a storyteller. This storyteller is going to spend a few minutes telling your table about a vacation that you've been on. So you want to think about an awesome place that you've been that you love talking about that you can get your table excited about. So if this sounds like you, 
you can vo volunteer to be the storyteller. The rest of you, you will see that there's going to be other cards on the table. OK, so how, how are you feeling telling that story? Very enthusiastic, very pumped. I want, I want to go back to my wonderful vacation right now. <laughs> OK. Did you find yourself talking to anyone in particular? I would say Lisa. I would say a right across from me. And Lisa, what number did you have on your card? Six. Number six. Oh, anyone else have a number six? So Lisa, can you grab the mic and tell us what you were supposed to be doing? I was supposed to be very engaged in the conversation. I nodded excessively <laughs> and, and explained many times how exciting and wonderful her trip was. Awesome. So my storytellers out there, when you're looking at your number sixes, did you find yourselves talking to your number sixes more than other people? OK, right. So this is how we are showing we are engaged. So what sounds and colors did you hear? OK, but did you notice Sandy's initial reaction was, right? Because Sandy, what were you listening for? Food and taste. Food and taste. And look at Sandy's reaction with, I wasn't, I don't know what, what, what sounds, what? And what is this saying? When we go in listening for one thing, or we are only listening for one specific thing, we miss the big picture. Who else had a reaction? I'm curious back here, because I watched this go down. <laughs> OK, so Shannon, did you hear what he was talking about? Um, no. <laughs> OK, because Shannon, what were you doing? Um, I was texting, sending emails. And okay eating and not paying attention. OK. And so this one is the one when we're on our phones. And this one, how many of you were on your phones, but would, if I, raise, if I asked you, did you still hear everything they said, would you raise your hand? If my husband was in the room, he would raise his hand. <laughs> because he can hold his phone, and as I'm talking to him, I will be like, Mike, you're not listening to me. And then he will repeat back every single word that I said. The thing is, though, and what I want to make sure you get with this one, unless, well, how did, you, how did it feel when Shannon was doing that? Well, I just kind of blew her off. And, you know, <laughs> I'm going I'm to go to the one that's really true. Right. And so not only does Shannon miss out on the story, but it's also missing out, right? And, and, it's, and even if Shannon said, yes, I heard everything you said, listening doesn't count unless we feel like we've be, we're being heard. So those of you who think you can multitask on your phone or be clacking away on your computer and think that that connection is happening, it is not happening. For all my number nines is that you are off the hook. You don't really have to tell your story. But number nines were you are the next storyteller. And I, 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 I upped the ante a little bit because I said there is going to be a prize involved for that next storyteller. And this one, when we think about this, right, when we're going in and thinking, hey, I've got my plan, I've got my MO, I've got my opinion, my thoughts, what my solution is, we can't hear anything that's going on. And so this story session is the active listening session. But what I want to talk about is some of those connection killers that you just experienced. And I call connection killers the behaviors, the actions, the words that we do that maybe sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing that slowly cut away at connection. And so there was, Lisa did a great, was a great example here of, of doing the head nod. And if I asked you all right now, what does active listening look like, what would you all start doing? Like, show me how you actively listen to someone. Right? And we all start doing this. Well, this active listening head nod is actually a connection killer. And why is that? Because we're nodding our heads, and that person is talking, and we're, you know, oh, they're sad, so we get our sad face on, and then they're happy, so we're doing that. But we're nodding our heads, and what are we really thinking about? Why are they talking so much? When are they ever going to stop talking? What am I going to have for dinner? We all do it. We're told to do this, but we get in this habit 
And instead of actively listening, because actively listening to me also implies that we're going to get ready with our advice, with our fix, with our solution, with our response. So what I like to talk about is, is not so much actively listening, but how do we listen with curiosity? So we're taking away all of the thoughts, and the only thing that's happening between our minds is curiosity. And the way I love to visualize this is I always imagine that everyone has like a big red balloon waving above their heads. So if you imagine every person that you ever come into contact with has a big red balloon waving above their heads, would you be able to talk to them? No, it's a little bit wacky, right? But if you have this image and you think, until I deflate the air out of the balloon, they don't want to hear anything that you have to say and you will not be able to get the big picture, it enables us to listen with curiosity. So instead of the fix and the advice, all we're thinking about is what is really going on here and what is this really about? And it's important to say those two words really because it's a completely different tone if it's like, what's going on here and what is this about, right? But that curiosity comes when we say, what is really going on here? What is this really about? and we let them get all of the air out of the balloon. Because just like my spare tire story, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, but there's so much more. The day we're having, the stress we have at work, the talk we have with our boyfriend, it's all adding to that air, and when we let, it all out with curi let them get it all out with curiosity, then we can hear the full picture. We can start to understand their emotions, and we can get to the truth of the story and then we get to the next step. After we've deflated that balloon with curious listening, we then relate to them with empathy. So when you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, when there's been an accident, something horrible happens, what's, your normal, what's our normal first response? What words do we say? Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry is perhaps my number one connection killer. This is a word that should be so you know, well-intentioned. We're so sorry, we're so sorry, but it is completely overused. It's almost become white noise now. And if you think about that quick response of like, sorry, right? And you're like, really? Are you sorry? Or we apologize for the inconvenience. We're so sorry. I'm like, no, you're not sorry. Like, you're reading from a script. Someone told you to say it. You don't care about me at all. You want me out of your face. So you're saying, sorry, go away. So there's also a well-intentioned and well-meaning sorry, but even when we say this, we're still missing out on that ability to truly connect. So I was working on a project with Avis Budget Group, and we were working with their rental agents because, you know, the whole Avis, we try harder. They had not been trying that hard, and they realized <laughs> <laughs> that they needed some help working with their customers. So I headed off to Houston Hobby Airport, and I was so excited to work with this team because they had a group of people that had done, wait for it, like an interpretive dance and changed the words up to that car wash song. I mean, everyone, like you hear that and you can't help but start tapping your toes. So they had done this whole song and dance, so I was so excited to meet the ladies that did this. So Aisha was one of the women, and she, I was in class and she wasn't there yet, so I was waiting for her to come, waiting for her to come. Well, halfway into the class, she comes storming through the door, and when I say storming, I mean, whips the door open, flies through the class, plops herself down, and sits there like this. And I'm like, hey, Aisha. It's not a word. So we're going through the class, and I'm talking about you know, how we listen and how we connect. And I hear, rah, 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 rah. she starts grumbling, and she's saying words that are inappropriate for lunchtime. But she was not impressed at all with what I was saying. And finally, I said, hey, Aisha, like, what's up? Like, what's going on? She said, you don't, this is all it's nonsense. Like, not going to work. Like, you don't understand. I'm like, what happened? She said, I was out there. We've got no cars. There's no cars in the lot. And this guy's coming up, and he's saying, I want a Nissan. I need a Nissan. I want a Nissan. And he's screaming at me about this Nissan. And he's talking about his wife and his travels. His Nissan, Nissan, Nissan. She said, he's yelling at me so hard. I started yelling back at him. Then the manager pulled me away. And, like, it was a mess. And she, I mean, she was a disaster. And so I said to her, Aisha, like, that is horrible. Like, it, it is never OK for someone to yell at you. And I asked her, well, what were you doing while he was screaming? And she said, you know, I just had my head down, and I was looking in the computer for a car, and I just kept telling, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
And so I said to her, okay, well, let's play it out. Would it have been different if you had just stopped what you were doing, looked up at him, let him get it all out, and said, sir, I can understand, like, you are upset, and it is completely aggravating and annoying when you want a car, and we don't have it. I'm Aisha. We're going to figure this out. And it was interesting. Everyone in the class kind of did this, like, huh, like, head nod at the same time. Because when we realize, right, we don't need to hear the sorry. When we hear that sorry, it's like putting that balloon on a helium tank, and up goes the air again. But if we had said that statement of understanding, empathy at its most basic, the feeling and the fact, all of a sudden we go from like us versus you to, hey, I heard you, I feel you, I'm with you, and now my arm is around you, and now we can move forward together. So at the most basic empathy, fact and feeling. When we talk about empathy, we also talk about wearing people's shoes, right? Like walking in someone else's shoes. You've all heard that phrase before, yes? Well, here's an activity that I'm not going to make you do, but if I did, it might be entertaining. What if I said, everyone, take off your shoes, pass them to your neighbor on the right, walk around? I mean, some might be like fabulous shoes, right? But most part, you're like kind of, it's kind of weird. And so I want us to think about this phrase because we say this phrase a lot, right? Like, let's like walk in someone's shoes. And it's, it's a fine phrase, but it's almost become a cliche. But if we think about it, I am not going to walk in Joe's shoes. I can't imagine where Joe's shoes have been. Well, that, that was not nice, Joe. I, I, re rephrase. I can't imagine where Joe's shoes have been. Um, I, right? I, I, can't, I don't know all of the history, all of the journeys they've been on. But what I can do is say, hey, Joe, let me walk next to you. Let me appreciate that those are the shoes that you're wearing. Appreciate the journey that you've been on. Because if we assume that we're going to get in someone's shoes, we can never fully know someone's experience. And then if I'm saying, well, you know, I'm going to be just like you, it actually just goes to build judgment. It goes to build like, well, you're not like me. You're not exactly the same. So how am I supposed to walk in your shoes? And if we're judging and we're assuming we can't be empathetic, and so we wanted to do is think about instead of walking in someone else's shoes, respecting their journey, respecting that their truth is their truth, our truth is our truth, and we can walk together to get to this resolution. So with that, we have deflated the balloon with curious listening. We have them look them in the eye, and we are relating to them with empathy. And then we get to the final step, which is to elevate the situation so they are raving fans and excited. Now, if you have done the first two steps, the elevation phase, so easy. But how often do we actually fully listen to the full picture? How often do we actually empathize? Normally, we just skip to this page, right? And Lewis, it's funny that he's not here because he said it, right? If you talk to me, I will give you everything for free. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that, my friend. Stay and listen. I'll save you money. <laughs> Because if we have listened, and if we are saying, I hear you, I'm with you, the next thing we need to do is do what? Say, how can we make this better? What can we do to turn this around? How can I support you? Because they're with us, and they feel us. We don't need to say, have a free lunch. Take a free hotel night stay. Like, we'll do I don't want that. I want what I came in for. But if I don't feel like you've heard me, and if you gave me a quick sorry, that's when I'm like, VIP suite, Dom Perignon for the whole crew, and like caviar on the side, right? That's when we double down and want the free. So at the, at, it's, it's, again, it's, if you've listened and you've, re, and you've related, then it's a quick ask of how can we make it right? They're going to tell you, and I can almost guarantee that what they say is going to be less than what you are about to offer. So that's from the client's perspective. But now I want to talk about from our perspective. Because I do remember my restaurant management days. And again, I'm like, I got to stop this. So then I joined the Peace Corps, which looking back, I don't know if I went from one world of craziness to another world of craziness. But it's a hard industry you are in. 
it's fun and it's exciting, but it's hard to keep in the game, especially you know, days, times being what they are. So I think about the connection killer when it comes to the elevate phase is believing that we can control anything but what we do to show up. If we think we can control people's responses, people's attitudes, people's actions, we are in for a world of hurt. And so the way to combat this, I think, is to help, is to go in with an intention of the type of person that we want to be, the type of professional that we want to be. And this was another lesson I heard, learned the hard way. I was on a project with BMW of North America, and I don't know if any of you have ever purchased a car before, but this is when I can probably start to see like, yes, and it's probably like triggering all of the fun that a car buying experience is. Well, those car guys get their reputation for a reason. They are old school, like they're like, why change? We can just keep selling cars. And my favorite is they're always like, we just grind them down. Like we grind them down until we get them. And I'm like, yes, grind them down. Um, so it was an interesting project to be on. So there was that little edge of just complete resistance. And I would walk in all Aaron style like, hey, what's up? Like, let's create some change. And they're like, get out of here. Well, slowly but surely, I, I went from like, hey, and then I would just kind of walk in, and I seriously was at the point that I was like, can you just clean size my sign-in sheets, and then I'll go away, and like, you don't have to talk to me at all. And they were like, fine, get out of here. Well, let's talk about how me, miss, let's change the world. I want to bring tourism to a small island. Did with that, like phoning it in. I'm not a real big phone it inner. And I was at the point that I would go in, have them sign my sign-in sheets, and I am not proud of this. I would then go and hide in the bathroom and text my colleagues all day, being like, what are you doing? I'm in stall three. Like, <laughs> not that awesome. So I realized that this is not how I really wanted to work. And so what I did was set my intention. And I thought about who would that person be that I really wanted to be, and this is what I want you to think about. And I thought, what would A, powerful, smart, energetic, impactful consultant do? And when I answered that question, I thought, I'm going to take action. And that action I'm going to take is I'm going to find one person every day in these dealerships that I'm going to impact. And it was pretty much, I think, like two days after I decided, this is my intention, this is what I'm going to do, I talked to a general manager, Brian. Brian, I'll be there tomorrow. Great, Aaron. We'll see you at 9 o'clock. We're ready for you. It's going to be awesome. So I go to the dealership at 9 o'clock. I'm like, hey, I'm here for Brian. They're like, Brian's on vacation. And I'm like, no, no, no. I talked to him yesterday. They're like, yes, 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 he's on vacation. I mean, this is what I'm dealing with. So there are these guys all huddled around the computer doing whatever they were doing. And they immediately are like, ah, but we're really busy and we don't have time. And I'm like, it's cool. It's cool. Like, I don't even worry. And guess where I went? I walked right out to the service drive. Because if you know someone who needs help in a car dealership, it is those service drive attendants. They got customers coming at them. They got the manufacturers coming at them. And I sat down next to my boy Doug for an hour and then my boy Travis for three hours. Travis spent that morning blowing up people's balloons. Like everything we talked about, it was the complete opposite. It was like he was a human helium tank. Like it was like one after another that I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? So we worked through. He, he had no idea. And he thought he was helping, but he wasn't. So at the end of our time together, he said to me, he's like, Aaron, no one has ever taught me this. I'm like, I am sure that they haven't. And it's not like gold star for me, but it was mostly here was that person. This is the one person. And I went back to the guys who were still randomly huddled around the computer. I don't know what they were doing. And they looked at me like, what are you, what are you still doing here? I'm like, awesome day, guys. Go check out the service drive. Like, see what happened. And they just had this confused look. And then off I went, like feeling energized and feeling like I had lived my intention. And so this is how we elevate yourselves. Who is this person that you want to be? That informs your action. So it's intention plus action, then minus the control. Because let's face it, we can go in wanting this and doing this. We can't control how people are going to respond to us. So it's letting go of the control. And then I also like to add a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Some people say assume positive intent. I'm always BOD, benefit of doubt. The benefit of the doubt that I walked out of that, those guys' offices, and they went and they talked to Travis. And we're like, hey, tell us about what happened. Who knows if they did or not. 
The benefit of the doubt that if I show up fully, if, I, if we bring what we need to bring, even to that angry customer who's screaming at us, or super angry, that they're going to be driving home later and be like, man, that jam was pretty awesome, and man, I was a complete jerk. It's so freeing, right? It is freeing to say, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't get the 35 emails about the napkins. Maybe they didn't get the note about gluten-free. It is freeing to give the benefit of the doubt. So with that intention, with that action, letting go of control, which is super hard, but we can do it, letting go of control and then the benefit of the doubt, this is how we elevate that experience. And there you have your formula. For when things are going sideways, things are getting derailed, conversations are like, whoa, what's happening? You, feel free to do it with me, folks, deflate the balloon, you relate to them with empathy, and then I like to also say you grab a hold of them figurative, figuratively and say, I got you, we're going to go with me, and then we elevate it by asking the questions, by setting our intentions, and by taking action. So the question that I had, which is a pretty um, big question to answer in the few minutes that we have, but I'm going to just give some thoughts, is how would you combat a toxic work environment where your supervisor is abrasive and your coworkers have ultimately given up? How can you actively change the morale and the culture? I was like, thanks, Brianna. Let me just, you know, handle this one. But it's it's an interesting convert. It's an inter. It was submitted. It was. Okay. It, it wasn't her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> no, that yes, sorry, man. I, what I meant to say, she's like, we have a few questions, and I was like, that's a doozy. Like that that one's good. Give me give me five hours, and we'll address that one. Um, but, but joking aside, I mean, we've all, I've, I mean, I've been there. And I think there's a few things, and it goes back to what we just talked about. Um, I think applying, or maybe perhaps there's an opportunity to deflate that supervisor's balloon. And what I say that is, have you been curious enough and empathetic towards them to perhaps understand their situation? Do they have things going on at home? Do they have a boss that's putting pressure on them? Do they have things going on that perhaps you don't know about? Um, so that's one way. I think there's also this other part of perhaps a lot of times like people don't know how they're showing up. And their style is their style. And not that that style is necessarily okay, but they might not have any idea. And again, I'm like benefit of the doubt. They might not have any idea of the environment that they're creating. And the other th part that I thought was so interesting about this is that you know, all of our coworkers, we all feel the same way. So my question is, and oftentimes we wait for that leader, and wouldn't it be nice if all of our leaders were inspirational and were powerful and, 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 and really led us to live up to our potential, but more often than not, they're not. So my question is maybe to let go of that expectation you have of having that leader create the environment, and if all of you are together, like looking at your ownership of what can you bring, what can you do? What is your intention? What's your action? And start the wave yourself. Like, don't wait for that person to turn it around. Um, and it is a complex issue, but a lot of times we tend to look at that other person and what they're not doing instead of saying, well, yeah, if we, are we all emailing and texting and, and WhatsApping about how horrible this person is? Is there a time that could be better served by saying, hey, let's define the culture we want. Let's start acting on that and maybe they'll come along. If it is a horrible, bad, really, really toxic work environment, leave, right? Leave. OK, any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to bring us back to that breakfast table in Panama and do a final thought about the formula. And we talked about the deflate, relate, and elevate with your clients and with your customers. But a lot of times we need to, on this topic of what we bring, oftentimes like it was at that table, and it's been 15 years now, so I've gotten some space around it, and I can tell that spare tire story without getting all teary and angry, but it took, it took me quite a few years to get there. Because what it was really about, it, again, it wasn't the weight, it comes, it goes, whatever. But in that moment, what it was really about for me was I was homesick, and I was lonely. And I had big expectations of changing the world. And I had to admit, I had no idea what I was doing. 
Like all of the techniques from my restaurant management years were not working at all. But what was interesting is that when I deflated my own balloon and got curious about what my real story was, and when I actually gave myself some empathy of, hey, Aaron, you're on an island. There's no electricity. There's no water. There's no refrigeration. You're pooing in a bucket, for God's sake. Like, <laughs> give yourself some ease a little bit. Understand why you're feeling that way. And then the elevation was really realizing that it wasn't so much there to like change the world. It was actually to have that conversation that I had with Hova. It was actually to connect with the islanders, to listen to them, to talk with them. And that's what it was. So when you have your moments of frustration with clients, with customers, with yourselves, apply the formula to yourself first. Right? What's really going on with you? How can you care about yourself, get curious about you, and then how can you say, hey, this is the person that I want to be. The, this is my intention. These are my actions. This is what I can control. The rest of it, see you later. So with that, the formula, again, to deflate, to relate, to elevate, this is the formula for connection. And when connection happens, I firmly believe the magic happens. Thank you so much for your time today and your attention. Thank you.